and welcome to Game Sack. And this time we're talking about games that may be rare or scarce. Yeah, or even just plain valuable that uh, they've held value over time. They're just good games and people want them and will be willing yeah. to pay a higher price for them. Yeah, it, like Dave said. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going to go first this time. I'm okay. sick of you going first. So. Yeah, I'm sick of going first. Okay. <laughs> and let's take a look at hmm, a really nice one on the Turbo. We've talked about Magical Chase on the PC Engine long ago. This is a pretty rare game, mostly due to its high demand. In fact, it usually sells for around $200 these days. But you want to know what's even more rare? The US version. This version goes for $250 minimum, Hue card only, and you are damn lucky if you can get it at that price. A complete version can cost well over $1,000. Supposedly, the unsold stock of the US TurboGrafx version was destroyed in a parking lot with a steamroller. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but hey, it's what I heard. What's more is that they made changes to the US version. Notice how the title screen is different. And they changed most of the graphics in the first stage as well. New background, new foreground, even a changed enemy. They even changed the main character sprite if you look really close. Check out the differences. Now, why they made these changes is beyond me, especially so late in the system's life. I mean, why spend the money to make changes on a game for a market where it probably won't even sell very well? None of the other stages seem changed from the Japanese version that I can tell. Anyway, let's talk about the game itself. It's a shoot 'em up where you play as a witch on a broom, kind of similar to the Cotton series. But in this game, you have two little options which are always floating around you, and you can change how they work in a few different ways by pressing the one button. They can also protect you from some of the weaker enemy bullets. There's a shop where you can buy lots of different items. It's kind of similar to Fantasy Zone in this regard. But fortunately, the weapons in this game aren't based on a timer. You can also buy special items which, if you tap the 2 button, restore a bit of life or power up your options and zap away the enemy bullets. The currency you use in the shops are the different colored gems that you collect after defeating an enemy. There's a shop right before the mid boss and main boss on most levels. Although this may not be the best shoot 'em up in the world, I, I think it's pretty fun. In fact, it's moderately challenging until you get the knack for it. The graphics look great in motion, and they're doing things that you wouldn't expect the Turbo Graphics to do, like copious amounts of overlapping parallax scrolling. The music is fairly good. In fact, three of the tracks found their way to my iPod thanks to the hidden sound test. There's even a Game Boy Color version of the game in Japan. Now what you're looking at here is an emulated version of the game. It's also pretty impressive and pretty scarce as well. This is the game that most people are missing to complete their US TurboGrafx-16 collection. And the prices don't look to be coming down anytime soon. Castlevania Legends was released on the Game Boy to average reviews in 1998. Out of the three Castlevania games released to the original Game Boy, this is the worst one. Igarashi was even quoted as saying that this game doesn't fit anywhere in the Castlevania timeline and that is somewhat of an embarrassment to the series. <laughs> oh man, that is harsh. After playing through this game, it's not bad at all, but for a Castlevania game, it's not as good as it should be. There are a total of five levels and they're fairly lengthy. You'll fight the same enemies on every stage with not much variety at all. Instead of a sub-weapon system, this game has soul weapons that you gain after defeating a boss. The best one that I found will refill your life bar for 20 hearts. Also new to this game is the burning mode. If you hit the A and B buttons at the same time, you become invincible for a short period of time and you move very fast. You can only use this feature once per level. But this is still a pretty cheap thing to have in this game as you can use it during a boss fight and not take any damage at all. The music in this game is okay, but the tracks are all fairly short which means that they loop many many times while playing the longer levels. After a while the songs actually start to grate on your ears as you reach to turn down the volume. Being a Game Boy game, each stage is popping with two different colors for the backgrounds. It's sensory overload, so be prepared if you play this. Graphically, everything is okay, but even the first Game Boy game, Castlevania Adventure, had more detail than this game. If you're a collector of Castlevania like I am, 
then this game is worth owning. It's pretty expensive complete in box, but it can be had for around $25 loose. Dave's talked about the Genesis version of Marble Madness before. He really didn't think much of it, especially the blaringly bad sound in Stage 3. Yeah, that's pretty bad. This game really isn't scarce or in demand at all. But what most people don't know is that there is a version of Marble Madness released only in Japan and it was made by Tangan instead of Electronic Arts. This is a completely rebuilt game from the ground up. The graphics are ever so slightly better if you look closely. The sound is also much more pleasant. Here's the part that usually causes bleeding ears in the US version. Ah, uh, much better. This game is pretty tough though. It's definitely tougher than the US version for sure. What's unique about this game is it lets you use an upside down mouse as a trackball. And of course it doesn't work with a US mouse, only a Japanese mouse. I wish I could say that this mode is better, but I have yet to try it with a Japanese mouse. It also kind of works with the Sega Master System sports pad when it's set in control mode. The control is pretty precise, but if you hold down the one button it moves a lot faster. Still, it's a better experience as a game for sure than the US version and it'll cost you about a hundred bucks. Einhanda is a PlayStation 1 shooter developed and published in 1998 by Square. Apparently Square was sick of ruling the RPG market at the time and started dabbling in other genres. For a first attempt at a shooter, Square did well. The whole game has a dark setting as if each mission takes place at night. The levels are dark and don't have a lot of color, but they do have lots of action. As you play the game you can take weapons from the enemies after you destroy them. So you have your basic pea shooter and up to three different sub weapons that you can switch between on the fly. The sub weapons all have limited ammo which is conveniently displayed for you by your ship and on the bottom of the screen. There are many different types of sub weapons and it's really fun trying them all figuring out which one is the best. The game's levels are all long and packed full of enemy ships. The soundtrack to the game is techno and is very fitting of the gameplay and feels dark and gritty just like the graphics. In fact, I like the music so much that I bought the soundtrack and listened to it almost daily for quite a long time. Sadly, the game hasn't aged very well in the graphics department. I mean, it's definitely still fun to play, but it's kind of similar to watching an old person doing mad tricks on a BMX or something. This game can be found on eBay, but it's still holding its value, so you're going to pay almost brand new price for it. Okay, let's take a look at Sonic the Hedgehog on the Sega Master System. Now this game is extremely common, but the US version is so rare that people are actually willing to pay over $900 for it. It's identical to the European version in every way except one. And that's the UPC sticker slapped on the back of the box so it could be sold in stores over here. That's it. You could even print out your own. But let's take a quick look at the game. Now basically this is just a consoleized version of the Game Gear Sonic game. A lot of people actually say that this is better than the Genesis Sonic the Hedgehog. It's a good game, but better than the Genesis version? No. All you really do in the game is maneuver through the stage and collect rings. Now occasionally you may have to defeat an enemy, but that's pretty rare. The collision detection isn't so hot. I mean look at this, that bullet didn't even touch me. If you get more than 50 rings in a stage, you go to a bonus stage where you bounce around like a pinball. I don't like these bonus stages, but I do like the music. Speaking of the music, they were somehow able to get Yuzo Koshiro to do the tunes here and most of them are pretty damn good. Overall, it's a pretty decent game for the Master System, but you'd be crazy to spend that much for a sticker on the box.
Joe, I gotta tell you, in a million years, I would have never ever guessed that a Sonic game would be sought after and valuable and people yeah. would want to collect it. Especially for that reason. I mean, what the hell? Yeah, a barcode? Yeah. Oh, I could slap one of those on there and... Yeah, yeah, you could. You probably could. You could. And anyway, uh, I guess it's your turn now. It's my turn and I'm gonna talk about a game that, personally, I really didn't care for, but I think a lot of you are gonna like it. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Know. Let's check it out. EVO The Search for Eden is an action RPG for the Super Nintendo published by Enix in 1993. The whole story is that you start out as a small life form like a fish and evolve it into a human or any other form to be able to reach Eden and be in love with Gaia. The way you play this game is by killing and eating other creatures that give you evolution points. You can evolve your body with these evolution points and you must if you want to survive and move forward. The game takes place in side-scrolling levels where you do all of your hunting and fighting. Honestly, after a while it gets very boring doing the same thing over and over again. Controlling your creature is fairly tough, mainly because the hit detection in this game is horrendous. Of course, the enemies have absolutely no problem hitting you, but good luck trying to hit them back in a close battle. The only way to win 90% of the time is to hit and run and hit and run until the enemy is dead. Every time you get hit, you pause momentarily and can't move. Wow, this is a great feature to this game. The music is very bland and not really entertaining at all. The graphics can be decent at times, but overall they're nothing great and the characters look pretty silly. But somehow, people love this game and go crazy for it. They'll even pay over $150 just for the cartridge. Mine is for sale, by the way. I know I'm going to catch some heat for this, but I just did not get any enjoyment out of this game at all. How this game commands high prices on eBay is beyond me, as I don't even think it's worth the $20 that I paid for it about 12 years ago. I'm guessing there just isn't many out there, which is the only reason I can think why this game is going for what it does. Little Samson by Taito on the NES was a poor seller and is now immensely desired by many collectors. It's a platformer kinda sorta like Mega Man, but not really. According to the legend, Taito wanted a really popular platformer to compete with the likes of Mega Man and all that nonsense. Unfortunately though, they decided to name it Little Samson. I mean, who's gonna wanna buy a game called that? Anyway, there's no text for the in-game story, but basically the Prince of Darkness has taken over the land. The king calls out for heroes to save it, and a human Samson gets the message, as does a fire-breathing dragon, a stone golem, and a little mouse. The first few introductory stages are just you getting to the king. You can play these stages in any order, and they're just there to get you used to controlling each of the four characters. Once all four of you get to the king, you join together to save the land. Well, except for the dragon. For some reason, he gets all pissy, so you've got to kick his ass. Anyway, after that, all four of you start on your platforming adventure and you receive your first password. You can now switch between all four characters at any time by pressing the start button. Each character has their own life meter, and if you've collected a potion, you can refill the meter of the character who collected it at a time of your choosing. But be careful, if a character dies, he stays dead until you either clear the stage or lose all of your lives and continue. Except for Samson, he's always there. Anyway, as you've probably guessed, each character has their own speciality. Samson can shoot really far and fast. Actually, he's throwing little balls or bells, but whatever. He can climb on walls and ceilings as well. The dragon can jump and float for a while by holding down the jump button. You can also hold down the fire button to charge up his shot for a more powerful blast. The stone golem is really slow, but his punches are extremely powerful. He can walk on spikes and he can take a lot of damage. He can also punch up and down, which is really useful. In fact, I like using this guy to defeat the bosses. Finally, we have the little mouse who basically drops tiny bombs as an attack. He's really fast and his life meter is really short. Like Samson, he can also cling to walls and ceilings. In fact, playing as the mouse kind of reminds me of playing as the mouse man in Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap on the Sega Master System. Does Japan just think that mice naturally stick to things or something? Anyway, this guy can get into some really small places, but other than that, I don't really like using him. Although the game itself is pretty challenging, there's rarely a need to actually switch to another character as Samson can get through most of the stages on his own. Switching does definitely make parts of the game easier though. 
there are lots of stages and some of them are kind of frustrating. The graphics are excellent for the NES. There's lots of detail and a fair amount of color and it really popped out among other games on the system. The music isn't very good though. Instead of each level having its own tune, each character has their own theme, and it's the same on almost every single level. I like the character themes except for Samson's theme, which really sucks. And the other themes, they do get kind of old pretty fast too. Now the upper levels and the boss fights have their own music, but they're really nothing special. Anyway, all in all, this is a pretty good game that's pretty hard to come by. DuckTales 2 was released in 1993 for the NES. This is two years after the Super Nintendo was available. As a result, it saw a much smaller production run, so this one can be really expensive to get in your collection, especially complete in box. Is it a great game? You bet it is. The thing is, though, that they really didn't add anything new in terms of gameplay compared to the first game. Capcom did make it easier to bounce on enemies with your cane, as now you just have to hold the B button, whereas before you had to push down in B. I sometimes have a few problems with the golf swing action on things that are above the ground, but I had this problem in the first game as well. It's still a nice feature to be able to pick the order you want to tackle each stage. You'll still find yourself searching every nook and cranny looking for hidden gems and ice cream cones. I love ice cream. And once you learn new abilities, you can go back to previous stages and open up new areas to find hidden treasure. The graphics are an improvement over the first game, which itself looked pretty good. Some of the backgrounds have a bit more animation to them, like flowing water or sand, and the colors can be pretty nice as well. The music isn't that great here, but it's okay for what the game offers. If you are a true collector, be ready to put down some good money for even a card-only version of this game. The Amazing Spider-Man Web of Fire is definitely the hardest US release to find for the Sega 32X. It came out towards the end of the peripheral's life and it was made in fairly small quantities. Plus it sucks, so I doubt many people bought it in the first place. That's right, games don't have to be good to be rare. In this game, some supervillains cast a giant laser web over Manhattan in order to get a $1 billion ransom. So off Spider-Man goes to save the island. In this brawling platformer, Spider-Man can punch and also throw some webbing to tie up enemies briefly. He can also jump and swing from his webs mid-air. Now what those webs are attaching to as he swings across the top of the skyline, I don't know. But anyway, before Spider-Man can take down the criminal syndicate, he's gotta rescue Daredevil, which is another superhero. I guess he must be easy to capture. Anyway, after you rescue him, he helps you out by giving you some Daredevil coins. If you have one of these, you can pause the game, select Daredevil, and he comes in and does a screen clearing attack. It does kind of break the flow of the game having to pause the game to do this, but it, he is pretty damn useful. That aside, this game is damn tough. The developers sacrificed precise control for smooth animation. This was in the 90s after Donkey Kong Country came out, so most Western-made Genesis games just had to rip it off with the pre-rendered silicon graphics thing. Now the animation is good, but I'd still rather have a tight controlling game. Spider-Man moves around really fast and it's nearly impossible to be precise with them. Oh, and don't get caught between these electrical generator thingies. There's no escape and it's really easy to get stuck to them. And this is only stage two. I don't think the developers even tried with this game. The music leaves a horrible first impression. Just listen to this. makes music like that and thinks it sounds satisfactory. It's music like this which really gives the Genesis a bad reputation for sound quality. It's too bad they didn't have an actual musician work on the game. This game goes for over $450 minimum these days. Most people just want it to complete their 32X collections because I can't imagine anyone buying it to actually enjoy playing the game.
And there you have it. Those are some games that are actually pretty damn hard to come by for one reason or another. Yeah, they are. And we've got a lot more. So yeah, it <laughs> might be another episode. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? But hopefully. Why don't you guys tell us what your most rare or valuable or game that you own? Yeah, we'd like to hear from you. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSat. Hey Dave, what's up? Hey Joe, you know, do you have Chichi Rodriguez Golf? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I saw it in the thrift store once, but why would I buy a sports game? You should have bought it. That was the stupidest thing you ever did. That game, yeah, it's a $4 game, but I don't know what's happened. Maybe the guy's dead now, but this game, the last bid I saw was $110. <laughs> you know what? Being your what? best friend, I've got two copies. This nice complete one right here. And I am willing to let you have one of them for $60. Sixty dollars, you say? Yeah, sixty bucks. Okay, okay. You're gonna love this. You're gonna treasure it. Watching the value go up and up. There you go. Good, good call, man. How about a twenty dollar finder <laughs> fee? Hey, Come you on. know I'm your friend. I'm doing this for. I could have sold this to anybody else. So you're gonna love your new purchase. All right, chai chai. Time to find out how much you're really worth. Found out yet. $4.99 buy it now. Blast! Dave got me again!